Good evening. I want to welcome you and invite you to grab your Bible. Find Genesis chapter 6 tonight as we continue our sermon series that Pastor Russ kicked off last week entitled Portraits of Christ, looking here in the Old Testament to the work and the portrait of God through the Old Testament, pointing us to Jesus Christ. Sometimes as a parent, I wish I had the eyes of a child. Don't you? I remember when Owen was small, we were driving down in our Jeep, down our road there in Kansas City. We had the top off. It was a warm, sunny June day. And I turned down a road that I soon realized was the parade route. And lining the parade route were rainbow flags. And your response was my response. Oh, Wesley, what have you done? In the moment, it was that young boy in the back seat strapped into his car seat that looked with a blue eye, childlike spirit that screamed out, hey, daddy, look, these people are celebrating Noah and the ark. <laughs> what I saw was the aggressiveness of a carnal culture my boy saw as the promised from our Christ. And tonight, I think there's probably some of you that have seen the flag that have flown, and you need to remind yourself to take back that flag for what it really means. And when we see that, we see it's a reminder that there is a far deeper destruction coming, but there is a far greater deliverer made available through the person and the work of Jesus Christ shown in these precious passages. In fact, as I read these passages, I, I cannot help but reflect whenever I was in sub-Sahara Africa in the middle of a drought and they were praying for rain. And as they were praying for rain, they were, because of their language barrier, they only had the New Testament. And so I shared with them, as I had an English Bible, I preached, I preached the Old Testament, I preached this passage, and they changed the way they prayed that the Lord would give them rain, but not this much rain. It's a reminder how even tonight we get to set with our Bibles in front of us, a precious, precious sound, and we get the Old Testament and the New Testament. We have that as an honor that not all believers around the world have. And so as you have that privilege, I'm going to ask you to stand with me tonight in the honor of reading God's Word. Draw your eyes, chapter 6. just want to start with a few verses beginning in verse 5. This is God's word. It says that the Lord saw that wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was so sorry, or he was sorry, that he had made man on the earth and he was grieved, or he was so grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I've created from the face of the earth both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made man. Don't miss verse 8. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Tonight I pray that God would show you grace tonight, but I want to be faithful as we come to his word. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I do thank you for this historic event that changed the world and I thank you that you have chosen by grace to save a few who believed in you and have trusted. Tonight, this room is a testimony of faith that transcends from one generation to the next, that believes that you're the one true God. There are men and women that want to live in righteous unity with you, and they want to do so because of the work of Jesus Christ. But Father, I pray tonight that as we come to this familiar passage that your spirit would speak open our eyes, allow us to see not just the events of the past that maybe we are familiar with, but the portrait of Jesus found within them. Lord, we love you. We thank you for the opportunity to worship you on this Wednesday and pray and ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Here's what we come to. We come to this portrait of Christ and what we record, what we understand is that it records a far deeper, darker, 
and more cataclysmic event than your child's storybook devotion may show. It shows a world that is full of evil. Wickedness has come to prevail. Rebellion against God has become blatant. And through this, it's a picture of a God who has the whole world in his hand. All of it. Yet through this, it teaches us not just a truth in the past, but it teaches us truths about where we live in the present, where we live in this cultural war and the foundation that we hold to in Jesus Christ. But in doing so, it takes you and I, believer, and points us to a future day of deliverance that comes promised through the work of Jesus Christ. And so to see that tonight, I want us to walk through this passage and I want us to see how it embeds these promises into our heart, into our faith, into our trust in the middle of this cultural agitation that we see on the televisions and in the news. And what we see first is when we come here that it reminds us that there is a destruction coming. There's a destruction coming. In fact, the Bible tells us beginning in chapter 6, that man began to multiply. They began to have babies. Actually, they had a lot of babies and they began to establish families. They drew into communities. And yet, as they drew into these communities, the actions of man became wicked. They rebelled against God. They perverted what God intended for good. And they ended with spreading this wickedness throughout all of the earth. The Bible says that the Lord, verse 5, take your eyes there, chapter 6, that the Lord, here's a good phrase for us to underline, that the Lord saw that the wickedness of man, and here's how extent it was, was great in the earth. So let me pause right there. The Lord sees and he sees all of the wickedness and what it's describing is the outward appearance of all of the wickedness was great among the earth, their outward actions. But then keep reading with me, verse five, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Do you notice how it separates the two right there with that word and? It describes the totality of their action, but it's strong in the inclination of their heart. Their hearts were wicked and evil. Now, here's what I love. I love that we have a multi-generational church, don't you? And I love the fact that some parents have walked through seasons of life that they can pour into younger parents that are walking through that. For instance, we have young families that have filled our children's building with littles that are learning how to potty train. You remember those days? For some parents, this is all that they're building their life around. They take their little toddler every couple hours to make sure that they need to go. And they also know the deception and the evil intent of their little precious kiddo's hearts. Because it's found right there in the potty training. You know, if you've had littles, you know how it works. You're, You're working, you think you make progress, and then all of a sudden their little wicked rebellious heart shows itself as they poop their pants and go after they have this squeezing of their eyebrows that looks like an angry old man. Their face becomes red And then the waif of the aroma fills the room. In that moment, they hide in the corner or hide under the bed. And you as a mom or you as a dad know exactly what's happened. The little sinner sinned in his pants. It's in that moment that we see the nature, but we also see sin. I think... When we look here at the picture, how it shows the outward action and the inward action of the heart or the intent of the heart, it doesn't require us like our little child to hide under the bed or find ourselves in the corner running from mom and dad. It's what happens with sin in our life. There's an outward sign that is nasty. And there's a waif of a stench that fills the room. And we act like God cannot see it. Verse five, 
What's the word I said, the phrase we needed to underline or mark down? God saw. Today, men, women, you may have grown past this stage in your life, and I pray you have. Don't you agree? (laughs) But we haven't grown out of that inclination of our heart to hide our sin, our wickedness. And some of you may focus on the outward action, like, hey, I'm not doing the outward action. But that anger in your heart, those thoughts of rebellion, they're just as stinky as the very action itself. And the Bible says that God saw the action. Today, God sees the action. There's not an action of man or woman that's beyond the scope of the Lord. He sees all the way from Africa to here in Springfield. He sees around the world. He knows every intention of your heart. He's the all-knowing God. That's what Genesis chapter 6 is reminding us. The Bible tells us within this that these actions taken personally by man have judgment that's coming upon them. Take your eyes, verse 11, because the Bible tells us that God acts punitively. He's going to judge the people that are wicked and rebellious. He says, verse 11, that the earth was also corrupt before God and the earth was filled with violence. Now, let me just stay right there. Not trying to completely gross you out with this imagery, but you understand that when the smell comes across the car or across the room, it's not the little toddler that feels the pain in their nostril. It's everybody else in the room. And that's what sin does. It's not just contained to one person Its smell comes across and it affects everyone. There's an aroma, a stench that comes with it. And that's what we see, that violence between one another, this enmity between one another occurred because the root of sin in their heart showed itself in the actions and it spread throughout all of creation. So the Bible says, God looked upon the earth and indeed it was corrupt for all flesh or all people had corrupted their way on earth. And God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, here's where destruction comes. He says, I will destroy them with the earth. As the people here were reveling in their sin, destruction was coming. In fact, destruction And a day of destruction had been set on the calendar by the Lord here. They continued to party and play and have all the fun, but there was a day of cataclysmic punishment that was coming upon these people when their wickedness and their rebellion was going to be judged. Mm. Don't you think we need to be reminded of this as well? Because as serious as the judgment here in Genesis chapter six was, there's a far greater judgment coming because there is a perfect judge that will judge one day every man, woman, and child. He will roll out a great white throne and he will bring before those any and everyone who has not confessed him as Lord and he will judge them. Judgment is coming. But the Bible says that today, He's the only one that knows when that day of judgment is going to come. Just like in Noah's day. And when he recognizes the date fixed upon the eternal calendar in which all creation rebelling against him will be drawn to a day of judgment, in that moment there is only one hope, and that is hope in Jesus Christ. He gives you not a judgment coming for those in Christ Jesus He gives you hope in it. And how do we know that? Because here in Genesis chapter six, when you and I ask the question, so Pastor Wesley, destruction is coming. How can I be saved? Here's how you could be saved. You have to understand secondly, that there is a direction given. 
There's a direction given, found here within this. Now, men, you need to hold in, lock in here with me because some of you have a really hard problem with directions. That baby crib, you just wanna go at your own pace with your own way and little junior's gonna fall through at the bottom. And the Bible tells us that little junior has specific instructions for his crib for his good. You should follow. And the same way for Noah in his day. God gave him specific directions on how he was to build the ark. Draw your eyes, verse 14 with me. God tells Noah, make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and outside with pitch. And this is how you should make it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits. It's width 50 cubits. It's height 30 cubits. You shall make a window for the ark and you shall finish it to a cubit from above and set a door of the ark, set the door of the ark in its side. You shall make it with the lower second and third deck. Now hear me, when Noah is hearing these dimensions, God is instructing him, giving him direction to build an enormous ark in their day. It's the equivalent of half of our building. 450 feet long. It's the equivalent of about 75 feet, 75 feet, 75, I'll get it right, help me here, 75 feet wide. It's four and a half stories tall. And that little window that goes across the top is only about 18 inches. Specific instruction. Even the type of wood that Noah is to use is given by the Lord. Now hear me. When I read this, I think that there's a problem. Because if we were in Noah's day and we heard the Lord give us this instruction, I think the majority of us would push back and resist what God had to say. Because after all, don't we need to have some creative license? Right? Ladies, you want to make the mixture and the recipe, but you want to add your own little special touch. Men, you want to carve out and make that project there, but you have to put your own little fingerprint. We're all like our little Rembrandt. We want to have our signature on the bottom. We want to add or subtract or change the order or the timeline for how God has given us direction. But that's not what he said to Noah. Some of you tonight, your greatest issue is not that you have been given directions you have been given directions that you do not want to follow. You have been given directions and steps to follow that don't follow your timeline. So you tried to cheat the system. Just think about it. What's it made out of? Gopher wood. Do you think that just popped up one day? No. The Lord had to take that little sprout of that wood and grow it. It took time. In fact, probably took between 55 and 75 years for Noah to build the ark according to the directions that the Lord gave him. And some of you tonight who internally wrestle with impatience and want to do it your way would have resisted halfway through this if you're lucky. And some of you tonight, the Lord has given you specific instructions on how you're to live your life. And you want to do it on your timeline. You want to use your money in your way and you'll give to the Lord when it's convenient for you. You want to use your time in your way and you'll serve when it's convenient for you. But Lord, I need this. I need that. I need to do this. And your to-do list moves you along and you reject the direction of the Lord. You know what? I read this passage and I know the tendency of my heart and your heart is to want to do things our own way. But I am so grateful that the Lord gave direction to Noah and tonight, I'm so grateful the Lord gives direction to me because he sees what I do not see. 
I mean, just think about it. In Noah's day right here, he gives specific instruction for a creation of an ark that had never been built before on the middle of dry land. It makes no sense whatsoever. Noah, using all of his human rational brain, could easily have rejected his trust in God and relied on his own understanding. But in this moment, he follows the Lord and does it to a T. And when he follows the Lord, he understands by his trust that the Lord sees in the future what he cannot see on his own. There had never, and might I say never will be, a flood like what occurred here in Genesis chapter 6. It was beyond the pea-sized brain of Noah to even come up to an understanding of what he might need for a future destruction that was going to come across all the earth. But do you know who did know who and what needed to be done? That's right. It's the Lord. And tonight, in the same way, he knows exactly what you need in your life for a future events that's not even on your pea-sized brain radar. And yet he loves you. And he gives you his word so that you can understand what his instructions are. This is what we see right here. The Bible tells us that God gave Noah this instruction, detailed instruction that point throughout the book of the Bible all the way through to Jesus Christ. No one comes through the Father except through Jesus. Tonight, There may be some who sit in this room and are watching online and quite honestly, you hear this story of Noah and you say, I don't want to have anything to do with a God like that. I don't want to have anything to do with a God who would drown the world. Hear me. It's not Noah and the world, Noah and God that were the problem. It was the world that was rebellious. It was the world that was wicked. It was the world that rebelled. It was the world that had evil intentions in their heart and evil actions by their hand. It was violence, and it's what spread across the world. It was the heart there. And so God did not need to be judged but man. There's a destruction coming. There's direction giving. Here's a third. There's an invitation offered. In Second Peter, it would tell about Noah. He would describe say how God did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness. As I made mention, it probably took between 55 and 75 years to build the ark. And so every day Noah would go out, he would harvest these trees, he would carve the beams, he would fasten them together. And over a period of time, it would rise above the tree line, four and a half stories tall, and it would showcase a testimony to all the world that something was different about this man. And can you imagine with me how many conversations of people that came to Noah and they're like, Noah, why are you building this ark? What are you building? Why are you doing this? And over and over and over, Noah was giving these gospel conversations, telling them that there was deliverance available. If it wasn't enough in the material nature of the ark, men just think of this. Some of you really, really like to hunt. This is like prime hunting right here. Every species on the planet is walking right by you, two by two. You want that zebra rug? You want the lion? You want the buffalo? You want that mule deer? That mule deer? Over and over and over. It's like, I would be a hunter in delight right here. God has gathered all of the creatures, that pheasant that flies, it's right through here. And each one of those rugged men are hearing a testimony as the animal and the elephant walk by. Why are these animals coming to this ark? Oh, it's because there's an invitation given to them to come. Tonight, that same invitation is made available, but many in the world would reject it. Why? 
It's because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way that leads to life, and there are few who find it. In Noah's day, there was a narrow wooden ramp that led to salvation. In our day, there's a narrow wooden cross that offers you salvation in Jesus Christ. It's a cross in which many of the world reject. They resist. And as a result, a cataclysmic flood is coming upon their souls. And the Bible says that in a matter of 40 days, that there was not a single mountain range on the planet that was not covered by the waters of judgment. Can I tell you what breaks my heart most about this passage? It's the imagery of men and women drowning. If you've got any sensitivity in your soul to your fellow man, and you think about what's taking place in this passage, that you go in to an ark, the door is closed, and the earth opens up a torrent of water, and those men and women as much as they may have ridiculed and rejected you, they come to a spot where the waters rush over them. And as they start to gasp, they're trying to find themselves to the top of the surface. Their head begins to almost feel like it's going to pop. Their eyes are coming out and they're desperately longing until that one moment that they can't stand anymore because their lungs feel like they're going to burst. They open it up, and the waters come in, and it drowns them. I think drowning and burning by fire are the two worst deaths. And the Bible tells us that one day there's a judgment that's coming, that the Lord's not going to come And he's going to flood the earth like he did. But he's going to put those who have rejected and resisted him into a lake of burning fire. Just think of that. The water element of drowning mixed with the fire of judgment that occurs in perpetuity. How these souls must have been agonized in this moment because they rejected holy and righteous God. Tonight, that may be your loved one. It may be your neighbor. It may be the person that pulls up next to you at the car line or walks next to you at the grocery store. It's when, ladies and gentlemen, our souls care for our fellow man that it changes us. And we, and the nature that we have, don't want harm to come to them. And so we say, there is an invitation offered. Come, come to Jesus. It's not come to Buddha. It's not come to Joseph Smith. It's not come to something else. It's come to Jesus. And in the Bible here, that's what we see, that there is an invitation offered. This is why I love this portrait of Christ. It provides hope to us that one day us in the ark of Christ will receive safe passage and we will come to a place where we have a new home and a new earth. Let me draw one final point out of this, that there is a new creation to be experienced. Take your eyes after this violent cataclysmic flood Take your eyes to verse 10 of chapter 8. And it's describing how Noah had waited on the earth, waited on the ark. Rains had subsided. He released an animal, a dove. And the Bible says he waited yet, verse 10, he waited yet another seven days. And again, he sent the dove out from the ark. Then the dove came to him in the evening and behold, here it is. Don't miss it. A freshly plucked olive leaf was in her mouth. And Noah knew that the waters had receded from the earth. All of the earth was judged. Destruction had come. But God in his plan had planned for a new creation to come forth. And it's found right here in this olive leaf in the 
mouth of a dove that all of this for Noah and his family who felt like everything and all of their life was going to be upon the ark now has the promise that new creation, new life has come. Today, the Bible tells us that same truth, that a far greater creation will come. It will come after the day of destruction where there will be a new heaven and a new earth. There'll be streets of gold. It will be unlike anything that we can wrap our minds around. And it has beauties that we can't even fathom. It will be a new place for those who have a new heart in Jesus Christ. And tonight, you and I, we have that promise that we can look beyond the coming judgment to see the promise of Christ and his presence in our life. I'll close with this. It says in Matthew that people went around eating and drinking, marrying. They went around partying in all their life while Noah was building the ark. It reminds us that there's a lot of distractions in our day that can take you away from the promise that comes through Jesus Christ. They can take you where you're sidetracked with this and that and this. And you miss that one day, judgment's coming. The only way to be delivered is through the cross of Jesus Christ, the door, the one who has made the way. And tonight, Jesus is inviting you to come. Come not like an animal. Come to be a son, to be a daughter, to come into the ark covered by the blood of the lamb that will save you from the destruction that's coming. But you've got to come like Noah, believing in the righteousness of Jesus coming by faith. Thanks for watching this sermon. We hope and pray that it's been a blessing and an encouragement to you in your walk with the Lord. If you have more questions, or maybe you're that person who's looking to take their next step in their walk with Christ, we would love nothing more than to connect with you through our website. For service times and information about other events and activities at Crossway, you can connect with us at crosswaybc.org. May the Lord bless you and keep you. We hope to see you again soon.